talk to you today about the house of Bethany. The house of Bethany, being, a, the, being the house of God. And we're going to look at some stories uh, in the Gospels today. And I, I think that my wife is just an amazing person. She, um, she is usually the life of the party and loves, loves to just be with people and loves to spend time together. That's my wife's love language. Did anybody read the Five Love Languages book uh, back in the day? It's a wonderful book to help marry. And there's all sorts of, you know, I think like five love languages for children, five love languages for pets, five love languages for business associates. Five, there's like all sorts of, you know, iterations now. And I couldn't figure out what my wife's love language was at first when I first heard of this concept because I'm like, she loves gifts. She loves words of encouragement. She loves acts of service. Like if you got to clean, if you, you do the dishes, wow, you just like, you, you know, you ring the bell, you do, you, you hit the mark, you know, and all these, all these, but, but so I'm like, I think you're all five. I think the Lord knew that I needed a challenge in my life and a, a wonderful, joyful challenge, but like all five, I think you're all five. But then I realized it was the one that she went without that was, it made it most obvious which one it really was. And that's uh, quality time. She loves to have quality time. And if she doesn't have quality time, that's where the biggest ache comes in her life. Or that's the biggest cry of her heart is we haven't had a lot of time just to be together. And my baby, Addison, I think that's her, probably her love language too. And she's still a cuddler, thank the Lord. She's almost 12 years old. And so she just loves snuggle time with daddy. She's like, you haven't cuddled me lately, you know? And, uh, and so uh, I just, she, she loves, she's like her mama. And, and my wife is just one of those people that people like to be where Grace is. People like, people used to call her the party thief because if she was at one party and she's like, oh, I'm gonna head over to my house or I'm gonna head over to this other place, then people would usually migrate from that. So sometimes her friends would be like, you left and then everybody went with you and left my party. Like, what gives? Like, people just like to be with her, you know? So even our, one of our nephews especially, he's always working things. Like, he comes over um, to the house, and he's like, for some family thing, and then he's like, Mom, can I spend the night with Auntie, at Auntie Grace's? She's like, no, we don't have time, and besides, you don't have all your stuff. He's like, well, actually, I already packed my bag. I've got, my, I've got everything in the car. I slipped, slipped it in the car. Please let me stay with Auntie, you know, and, and he'll be on his best behavior. He'll go, I'll be quiet. I will clean up after myself. I'll do it. It's like he doesn't want to ruin the opportunity to be at Auntie's house. I mean, they used to even have a song called Auntie's House, like that the, the, they used to sing uh, to get time. But people just like to be, and I believe that, that God's love language is that he likes to be with us, is that he likes to share his presence with us. In fact, I've been writing on the presence. If you didn't know, um, that I've been, I've been writing a daily devotional on the presence. And if you go on our Sunrise app and you look up my newsletter, you can sign up and get emails in your inbox. I know I'm losing more subscribers than I'm gaining right now because not everybody that first was on, my, on the list wanted a daily email. But some of you <laughs> are loving daily emails on the presence. and just want to make that uh, available. But one thing I'm learning as I'm looking at the presence of God through the scriptures is that God loves to be with us. He loves to be with his people. And we don't have to earn our way into God's presence, but we do purchase intimacy with, we do purchase intimacy with intention and with time. And it's impossible to build relationship. It's impossible to build a history with somebody without spending time with them and cultivating. And so this isn't a message about duty today or obligation as much as learning to delight in knowing him and adoring the Lord. And I believe that the Lord is going to be speaking to us about the house of the Lord, about how that should impact our, our, our lives, our households, and ultimately, collectively, as the house of the Lord, that we're to be a people of worship and adoration because Jesus is a worthy of a people who adore him. He is a worthy of a revived people. He is, he is worthy of a people who are awestruck and filled with wonder at the greatness of, of who he is. And I believe that we've come to a place in our culture where we've t started to teach for a long time that, that anything can be sacred if you do it under the Lord. And, and I do think that's true but to, to a certain degree, but after a while of saying that anything can be sacred, then pretty soon nothing's sacred. And I've heard it from the cry of some of the saints that have a few more years on me, and they'll say, is, 
anything sacred anymore? And I just want to proclaim today as we look at being a house of Bethany to say that there is something that's still sacred and that's the worship of the Lord. That's pure worship. Worship is still worship. And in, in, uh, in Mark 5, 6, we hear this, we read about this story of a man who was very troubled. He was demonized. He was mentally tormented and afflicted by evil spirits and he would break chains in a cemetery and he would cut himself and no doctors could cure him and he wasn't in his right mind and and Jesus shows up on the scene and it says, Jesus steps on the shore at Gadara and it says in, in Mark's Gospel 5, 6 in the New King James Version that he comes and he worships or he comes and bows before. And that word for bow or prostrate yourself in the original language is, is a word of worship. And it, even though he had all these demons, we were to find out a few verses later that he had a legion of demons, which was a reference to a, a, a Roman uh, a legion was a group of soldiers that numbered up to or around 4,000 soldiers and he said you know what is your name I'm legion I'm I've got a whole horde of demons I got thousands I'm tormented but all those demons couldn't stop that man from coming and running to the feet of Jesus when Jesus stepped on the scene and what did he do he bowed and worshiped him he bowed it that that you know in the Hebrew and the Greek and we did a sermon I think sometime earlier in the fall about worship and we talked about how there's different words in the Hebrew and the Greek for worship. And, and he bowed in worship. Now, in some of our modern teaching, it would be like, well, you know, when you're just out uh, on the assembly line, if you do it to the Lord, that's worship to God. If you're mowing the lawn and you're fly fishing and you go, wow, isn't this a beautiful day, God? That's worship unto the Lord. And, you know, if you're, uh, if you're running around and, and, and having fun, and I certainly believe, believe that, uh, that God, uh, I don't know, remember, know if you remember the story of, uh, Eric Liddell and Chariots of Fire and he's a runner and, and he was called to the missions and his, I think it's his sister that's saying like, but you're supposed to be a missionary or you know, why would you waste your time running? It's not very spiritual and he's like, God made me fast and I feel his pleasure when I run. You know, so, so there's nothing, there, there is something good about that. I preached on it just a couple weeks ago and I'm not trying to speak out of both sides of my mouth, but there's tension in scripture. And, and there's, there's a tension that we're supposed to live in as believers. We should work under the Lord. We should do hobbies under the Lord. We need, some of, we need a break sometimes. We need to have, I'm, I'm not against any of those things. But in Mark 5, that man did not bow at the feet of Jesus and build him a table. He didn't like, I'm going to go fishing now and this will be an act of, he, he spent time at Jesus' feet. And it was actually the atmosphere of worship, of the acknowledging, bowing and acknowledging the Lordship of Christ that released a miracle in that man's life. Now, there's different stories in Scripture. Paul and Silas worship in the midnight hour, and they get set free from prison. But I, I think that Paul probably was worshiping, too, when he was in the Roman prison at the end of his life. And he had to worship the Lord Jesus unto his death. So I'd like to say that every time you worship, you'll get what you want. <laughs> but... That might not necessarily happen. But what I do know is that when he's exalted, everything, all of his will and purpose is for his kingdom. Yes. The, the, the miracle power, the power to endure, the power to suffer, the power to experience resurrection life is all available in his presence. And, and to be a people that come before his feet. And so it's true that we can do anything under the glory of the Lord as we do it unto him. It's, it's, an, it's an act of worship, but... I believe that worship is sacred. And the reason places like these altars are meaningful was just, I forget how it came up with Pastor Craig this week and Pastor Noma, I guess, we were talking about some things and talking about, well, it's at this place that we do communion. It's at this place that we baptize people. It's at this place that we uh, have weddings and people make covenant vows with the Lord. It's at this place of the altar that, that we pray for people. It's at this place that we come and bow and worship. And, and, and I do believe there, there, there is something important about keeping something sacred in our life. And in our church and in our culture. And there's somebody that knew this very well. And she was Mary at Bethany. And in Luke 10, let me just pray. Father, just take these few minutes we have. And give us a revelation of your worth. And deliver from us from busyness. As one of my mentors used to say, busyness is not of the devil. It is the devil. Lord, deliver us from weariness tiring motions and repetitive things that drain us and keep us from your presence and let us be a people at your feet let us be a people that bring our best and we spend it on you we lay down our pride we lay down our ambition we lay down our anointings and giftings 
even the good parts of our lives. We lay down the struggle, the seasons of struggle and weariness, and we just pour it all at your feet. And we'd be a people that experience the glory at your feet. We'd be a people that know you, God, and behold you, that we might carry the fragrance of your name everywhere we go, that others might come to learn to know you and be those that sit before you in relationship. In Jesus' name, amen. What a sweet presence of the Lord in this place. Thank you, Lord. We never want to take for granted his presence. Take not your spirit from us. Luke 10, 38 and four, through 42. As Jesus and disciples went on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Mary at Bethany, Mary and Martha, sisters of Lazarus, there they are, and Martha's busy doing what needs to be done to host her guest or take care of the needs of the house, and Mary's sitting at the feet of Jesus. Now, I've heard people preach sermons on this that some of us have a, some of us had an administration gift like Martha and some of us have an intercessory gift like Mary that just sits and adores Jesus. And I would like to tell you that that is not what this scripture is teaching at all. Now, it is true that some people are administrative and Jesus is not condemning people with administrative gifts or service because that is a spiritual gift, both service and administration. And we need people that serve and take care of things. There's nothing wrong with serving. This is a story where somebody is doing what was right in that moment and being, and somebody's not doing something that's not at the right time, that's distracted and is being loving, very lovingly, but lovingly rebuked for being distracted when uh, they should have been learning from her sister who is sitting at the feet of Jesus. Now, we have a lot of ways we could go with this text. It could be that you, Jesus is so revolutionary and counterculture that here he is empowering a woman because no woman would sit at the feet of a man to learn, to sit at his feet. And so it's a picture of not only devotion and worship, but it could be a picture of Jesus empowering a woman, that she could sit and learn from a rabbi, that she could sit and learn. So, so he's elevating Mary, and he's giving her an opportunity to, to, to learn so that she could be effective for for future ministry. But I think what we really see here is a picture of relationship, a, a picture of adoration, a picture of choosing uh, the right priority. And it's not like, you know, uh, we don't need to pray for deliverance over the Marthas that are servant-oriented or administratively gifted. That's not what this passage is about. This passage is about what, however you're wired. Oh, because on the flip side, I almost forgot, there is no spiritual gift of intercessor, by the way. Now, it's true that certain people, for whatever reason, tend to feel drawn to a life of prayer, but every single believer is called to a life of prayer and intimacy with God. There, there are intercessors in the Bible, but, but we don't see in any of the lists of gifts that some people are called to pray and some people aren't. Again, some people give their life to a greater devotion. It, people that are prophetic, people that are givers, and people that are exhorters, it, they, as people have examined these things and done little studies, just tend to be those that end up engaging in prayer the most. Uh, and so you, you might have a propensity to love to pray and spend time alone with Jesus. And you might have a propensity to like to do things and, and be active. And there's nothing wrong with having either of those spiritual gifts. But what I'm talking about today is a matter of how we prioritize our lives. And I believe that the Lord gives us pictures of what the church could look like. And Mary is this amazing picture of just not getting too busy. And, you know, there's a lot of ways you can do church this day and age. You can, you can build church around so many things. But a house of Bethany, a church that has the anointing of Mary of Bethany is a church that learns to sit at the feet of Jesus and adore him because he's worthy of our time and our attention. And we can get busy with many activities. We can do all sorts of amazing things. And I'm sure we'll have programs. We'll have Jesus communities. We'll have conferences and times like that. But may we never forget our first love. May we, never, may we never try to graduate beyond being a people that learn to sit at his feet and just spend time in his presence. That's the secret and power of the ministry of Jesus. That's the, that was the, the success of Mary's life. Um, the, she chose what was better. Would you choose what is better and choose to worship him and adore him? Would we choose to learn to sit at his feet? People have said before, if you want to find out how popular 
a senior pastor is, come on a Sunday morning. If you want to see how popular uh, an evangelist is, come on Sunday night or Friday night. If you want to see how popular Jesus is, come to the prayer meeting. Right, but and there's and 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 there's a little harsh edge to that, but there's also some truth there, right? Is that that we need to be a people that learn to just adore Him and behold Him, and our our lives should be formed by being a people of His presence, by being a people that sit before Him and minister to Him without our own agenda, but wanting to take care of the needs of our heart. And the story continues in John 12 at a later time in Mary and Martha's life, in, in Jesus' story, as he's approaching the Passover, as he's approaching his suffering, the passion where he would die for the sins of the world on the cross. It says in John 12, 1 through 8, Then six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus was who had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one who sat at the table with him. Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. But one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, uh, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, Why is this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box. And he used to take what was put in it. But Jesus said, let her alone. She has kept this for the day of my burial. For the poor you will have with it you always, but me you do not have always. And here we see that Jesus is speaking about Something that's powerful, right? Something that's self-sacrificial. That Mary had this love for Jesus. And Mary was concerned primarily about the needs of Jesus' heart. And this is a beautiful picture for us as believers and as a church corporately. Is that a house of Bethany, a house that's modeled after the devotion of Mary at Bethany, is a house that wants to take care of the needs of Jesus' heart first and most. Amen. Jesus we, it's maybe hard for us to think about this, but Jesus doesn't have needs like he's insecure, right? Like he needs us to complete him in one sense. But there is something about us being damaged by the powers of sin and being separated from him that brings an ache to his heart. The Bible says that he's not willing that any would perish, but that all would come to the knowledge of the truth. And what is the one thing that Jesus wanted in the garden of Gethsemane before he would go to his suffering shortly after this passage in John 12? He wanted his friends to stay up with him and pray. And they could not even pray for an hour in his greatest hour of need. He could have had the angels come down. He had direct, of course, communication with the Father. He had a, a regular prayer life. But there was something about the companionship of, of humanity, something about the companionship of men and women of God that poured devotion and took care of the needs of his heart that touched him in a way that nothing else could. Do you realize that you have a way to touch the heart of God like nobody else can, like nothing else in all of creation can, in a way that the angels cannot touch his heart? He gets adored by angels, unbroken praise in heaven, but there's something about there's something about a people like Mary of Bethany that just come before him to say, I will give something that's of value. She takes something that could have been a year's wages, something that was very, very costly, something that, that, uh, that, that was expensive, right? And she humiliated herself. And I mean, in that culture, and I think you could argue today, a woman's hair is her glory, right? Like if you look at how much a man's haircut costs versus a woman's haircut, we know that a woman's hair is her glory, right? We just had to talk about it. Somebody's like, you know how expensive the hair? I said, I know. I just, I just had to like tap out and be like, you know what? I, I don't know why they cost like that. And, you know, but you just do you. I want you to be happy. And that's what hair costs. Okay. Right? But she takes her hair. She takes her glory. She takes her pride. And she bows at the feet of Jesus and begins to take this oil that costs her very much and begins to wipe the feet of Jesus. And a fragrance of that devotion begins to fill the house. When a house begins to give themselves to the adoration and worship of Jesus, people can get very religious and offended. People can get very upset. Judas is, is very upset. And all of a sudden, well, that could have been given to the poor. Oh, that could have, that, this could have been done for that. Or this could have been done. And we get into this limited way of thinking when our highest priority should be ministering to the needs of his heart. 
Of course, we should touch the needs of the poor. Of course, we should be about service and proclaiming the gospel and, and making disciples. And there's, there's many things for the, the church to do, but our, our highest calling is to sit at his feet and to adore him and to minister to the needs of his heart. Mother Basilea was a Lutheran nun, I guess, if you will. She started a ministry. She writes a book called, My, I think it's called My All for Him, if I remember correctly. And she talks about how when we suffer and how we choose to spend time in his presence and give our lives to him, how we enter into the sufferings of Christ and minister to the needs of his heart in only the way that we can. And I think that that's really what we're after as a church and as a culture here is that we want to minister to the needs of the Lord's heart first. Amen. We're going to keep praying for each other. We're going to keep discipling one another. But what if we were a people that cared mostly about what he cared about? Yeah. God, show us your heart. Yeah. How can I alleviate some of the ache in your heart? How can I minister to you? What, what, what could I do today? And our, uh, one of our, my friends, Theo Culianos Jr. was here in, I think, 2020. And he talked about that when I interviewed him. And he said, you know, he learned from sitting with the, the Evangelical Sisters of Mary, which is the ministry that Mother Basilea started. He said, I learned that to go to prayer is just to go to that place where I say, Lord, today, what's hurting your heart? And if there's any way that you could share with me something that would bring, that would minister to your heart, part of that burden that I could, pair, could bear, I hope that you'll come and trust me to share those things with me so that I can minister unto you. What about a people that become like Mary, that become not busy or distracted, but live a life that honors the Lord? Firstly, we see that service is good in its proper place. I want us to remember that if it's submitted to a life of devotion, if it's submitted to a life of wanting to adore the Lord. Secondly, Martha was distracted, and we see a picture here of we've got to remove distractions I believe that that is the greatest warfare that we experience. I believe that's the greatest warfare I experience as a pastor. If you, you could pray for me in any way. You could pray for grace. You could pray for us. It's like pray that they don't get distracted from the presence of the Lord. Pray that they pray. <laughs> that, that's, it. That's, the, that's, what the war, that's what the war is all about. It's about busyness. It's about distraction. It's about, uh, you know, getting consumed with there's to-do lists and there's pressures and there's needs and, and, and all, uh, whether it's just in your family or it's just in life and you can move through life without spending time at his feet. So let the Lord, if we're going to be a house of Bethany personally or corporately, then let's be a people that aren't so distracted. Thirdly, Mary chose the good part and sitting at his feet. The glory is at his feet. People are like, oh, I don't experience the glory of God. Do you sit at his feet? I don't experience the presence of God. Do you sit at his feet? He promises, I will make the place of my feet glorious. Yeah. Right? Jesus said, where is the Father? My Father who's in the secret place. If you learn to go to sit before the Lord and to minister to his heart, you're going to experience his presence. Is it always a sensational feeling? Not always. Right? But I'm here to tell you, if you want to encounter his presence, become a person that goes and sits at his feet like Mary did. Amen. Fourthly, Mary lived at the feet of Jesus. We learn from her that to waste our life in worship and adoration is not a waste at all. We're going to waste our life on something. We're going to give ourselves to something. And Jesus says she chose the good part, and what she's chosen will not be taken from her. So our intimacy and our devotion with the Lord, it carries on for eternity. It carries eternal ramifications and benefits. We never know what the Lord will do as we stay before him. Pastor Mark Bratrud taught our pastors in our fellowship after he preached these five sermons on revival a couple weeks ago. Monday morning, these pastors from our fellowship came and he taught us three principles from the book of Colossians, chapter three, as a minister. He said, I always pray these three things, that I would stay dead because the scripture says, you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Yeah. Seek hiddenness, stay hidden. And thirdly, wait for glory because it says we will also appear with him in glory one day. So he said, we got to remind ourselves to stay dead, to seek hiddenness. Mary sought the hiddenness of sitting before him. You know, we get so trying to self-promote or try to do certain things at different times, but we have to trust that the Lord sees us, that the Lord knows us, that the Lord will open doors for us at the right place in the right time. One of our apostolic elders, Dr. List, tells a story about he had to shut down his website because of different nations that he was traveling into. He had to pull all his, his promotions. 
And it was funny because I, when I first, my dad first told me about him, I'm like, man, somebody that's been to that many nations that's consulted presidents and I'm going to find out about him online. And it's like, there's nothing on there. And I'm like, what is going on? How could you do this? Well, the Lord will sit him on an airplane next to somebody who's a parliamentary leader of one of the most powerful nations in the Middle East. <laughs> and his, this guy's like invites himself to his house. I must go to your house. And his wife finally, he comes to his house and goes, why do you want to talk to my husband? Because if I, when I am president of our nation, I will consult your husband and he will help me. And he's not even a Jesus follower. But he's just on a plane. He calls it the Magoo anointing, right? <laughs> Mr. Magoo. He just ends up in the right place at the right time. <laughs> he's at this home. He's at this home and he's in the middle of the night. I think it was four or five pastors from Fiji show up at his doorstep. I remember he told this, this to a, a meeting of leaders, and I saw a spirit of repentance go through this whole room of apostolic ministry leaders. There's a conference in Texas, and Bishop Joe Matera interviewed him. He starts telling this story, and you could just, it was so strange because he's telling this beautiful, powerful testimony, but it's like it convicted everybody in the room because of striving and ambition. And, and he just, he tells the story. He's sitting at home. It's like raining outside. It's late at night. These, these pastors show up. And he's like, is this the home of, of Stephen List? And he's like, yes, it is. And he's, they're like, our country's in danger. There's a coup. And we prayed and asked the Lord, what do we do? And he gave us your name and your address. And we came together and talked, and we all had the same name. And we flew here to find you. You need to come to our country. He got to consult, I don't know, the president or prime minister. I'm not remembering their the governmental structure. He got to speak nationally. They gave him all the news stations of the whole TV. He gave a word that came true. I mean, it was crazy. I don't have time to tell all the things that happened. Then he gave a prophetic word when he was there doing this to one of the leaders that he would be, God wasn't done with him in government, and, after, and he had just lost his place in government when he was there. And now 20 years later, that guy was reelected to the head of the country from the word that the Lord gave him. So he tells this amazing testimony. He says, you're never really hidden before the Lord. And we think, does God see? Does God know? But we have to be a people that learn to humble ourselves and adore him and worship him no matter what. Yes. It's not about being seen. It's not about being known. It's not about so many things that we strive for in life. It's about a life of devotion to Jesus. It's about letting him shape our desires, letting him. And, and I believe that a, the fruit of a prayer life is answered prayer. And we should expect answered prayer. And we should expect miracles. I believe all these things. But our highest priority shouldn't be our list of needs, wants, and desires. It should be what are his needs, wants, and desires. And how do we minister to his heart? If we're the bride of Christ, the house of Bethany ministers to the bridegroom. Right? Is that we personally and we collectively become a people. And that's why we let worship sometimes and I don't we don't always worship for the same amount of time every Sunday morning but the reason we've been letting worship go a little bit longer is because I want to make sure that we're ministering to his heart because I'll, more than us coming together we're a kingdom of priests and we have an anointing to minister to him we're called every one of you if you are born again and you've received forgiveness of sin and eternal life you become a part of a royal priesthood and priests have a job, and it's to keep the fire burning on the altar. It's to keep the sacrifice of praise going and ministering to his heart. So people are like, well, you don't have to really be, a, you don't have to go to church to be a Christian. We've got such a low view of the church. It's so sad in this culture. We've become such rogue, independent, wild, wild west Christians that we don't realize. Somebody just told me, well, I think God's going to start moving outside the church. And I'm just like, well... How is he going to do that? Because only the church has the keys of the kingdom. That's going to be pretty sorry for those people that aren't a part of the church because they're not going to have any authority to bind and to loose and transact kingdom business because he only gave that to the church. Now, I realize that sometimes the institutional church, if they become corrupt in their doctrine or things like that, or they're leading people into other religions or other worldviews that are ungodly, that sometimes God has to go outside of institutionalism. But it's still the church. It's still the work of the church. And that we as a church would understand that this isn't going through the motions. This isn't like, and this is like, I love, and I'm, and I'm not shaming anybody that watches online or has health concerns or any of those things that they need to spur a season and stay online or you have a sick kid. That can be a wonderful gift. But the reason we must gather and assemble is because we're to bring corporately an expression of a sacrifice of praise to minister to his heart. This is, this is an act of worship. Go, well, I just sit there and I just sing songs. That's not just sitting there and singing songs. 
It's the gathering of God's people to minister as priests of the Most High God and offering a praise that brings His presence into a city, that brings His presence into a region that, 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 that says that we are a people that can be unified. Hey, the government, if you all follow the same rules and laws and political party, you'll all be united. You'll have your needs met. But no, in the church, we're an expression of the reign of God. We are the custodians of the kingdom of God. That when we come together under King Jesus, doesn't matter our, our background, doesn't matter the color of our skin, doesn't matter our education level, doesn't matter which side of the train tracks we live on, but we can come together because our King Jesus brings us together and he helps us meet one another's needs and build one another up and love one another and be the community of God. So when we assemble together and bring worship that blesses his heart, we're pouring oil on his feet. We're pleasing His heart. We're ministering to Him. We're fellowshipping with Him. Come on, heaven is released in that atmosphere. I might be getting ahead to some of my other sermons, but... But let's be a house of Mary. Let's be a church that's answering the call to worship, prayer, and adoration, where we're overflowing, where worship is about Him more than it is about us. That's what being a priest of all believers is about, is about we get access to the presence. Amen. We get access to the throne room. Amen. We get access to minister to his heart. He's made a way for us. And sometimes what we bring to the Lord is truly a sacrifice of praise, isn't it? Sometimes you're going through hardship. You're going through hell and high water. But you go and you worship and you minister to his heart. And you say, Lord, I'm not here to prioritize. You think of all the warfare and all the opposition you've been through, and you just come and you make a declaration. And sometimes the greatest act of faith is just going to worship. Oh, Pastor Scott, who's watching us and cheering us on <laughs> with the cloud of witnesses now, he used, to, he used to always say, you know, sometimes I see people delivered of demons by just they just don't quit worshiping. It's like it, finally the spirit just gives up because they just become so devoted to Christ. They become so devoted to his lordship, so devoted to, to, to lifting him up and exalting him. And we just become a people that become Jesus obsessed. Yes. So we say our, our Sunrise is, is a spirit filled church family that's all about Jesus. Yes. And we want it to be more than a slogan. We want it to be the fragrance of our lives. Yes. So we're people all about Jesus. Oh, you've been to that church? Oh, man, they love Jesus, don't they? Man, they are Jesus people. They're, they love. They love to worship. They love his presence, don't they? they? They love to represent him. They love to talk about him. They love to brag about him. They love to let other people know about him. It's all about him. And that's what, that's what a house of Bethany is all about, a house that pours their devotion on Jesus. That's why we're trying to develop more prayer times and times of worship throughout the week. And it's just, we want to be a house that pours our love on Jesus and, 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 makes, and makes much of him. Could we stand as we close today? We need to make time for the next service to... Find parking and all that. Maybe the team could just lead us uh, in, uh, is anyone worthy? Is that all right? Yeah. If you're not right with God, the most important decision you can make is to repent of your sin and to yield your life to Jesus. Jesus said that when Mary anointed him with oil, that amount, that intensity of fragrance, that she was anointing him for his burial. And it would not be long after this that Jesus was hanging on a cross. Some people believe that, that, would have been, that there would have been such a strong fragrance from the, on Jesus that well, Jesus was getting arrested and he would go and be whipped and 39 stripes on his back and a crown of thorns put on his head and he's being mocked and rejected that he still would have been able to smell the fragrance of Mary's anointing. That is, he was getting hung and stretched out on a cross after marching up to the hill of Golgotha and he's, 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 he's screaming, you know, Father, why have you forsaken me? That he still would have been able to smell the fragrance of Mary's oil and her devotion and her worship. You know, the Bible says that Jesus was going to die on the cross by the prophetic scriptures and that he would be buried and that he would raised again. And, and Mary was memorializing the fulfillment of the biblical prophecies that Jesus is the Messiah, 
that he is the son of God come to the earth for us. And those same scriptures not only predicted that he died and that he'd raise again, they tell us that he's coming back again. But before, before he comes back, the Bible says that he was seen by witnesses and he ascended to glory till he waits till the last enemy is destroyed that is death. He reigns now and he's waiting to come back. If you give your life to Jesus today, you will receive forgiveness of sins. And when he returns on judgment day, you will be counted with those who are redeemed. And you will have eternal life that lasts forever and ever and ever. I just want to know, is there anybody here today and you say, that's me. I need, to, I need to give my life to Jesus. I'm not confident that I have forgiveness of sins. I feel bound to sin. I feel I'm hopeless. I don't know that I have eternal life, but I want to turn my life to Jesus. I want, I, want to, I want to give my heart, my devotion to him that I might receive forgiveness of sin and have new life. Is there anybody here? You'd raise your hand up right now. Just wave it high if you're here. I want to see it so we can pray with you. It's so important, so important that you publicly proclaim, I need to give my life to Jesus. Is there anybody? It's the first step, but it's a very important one. I just want us to adore the Lord today. I don't know totally how to close this service other than to just say, we've been praying for a packed house, packed altars and packed hearts and just today that maybe the Lord would pack the altars and pack our hearts with his glory and with a love for his presence and that we as the church today would just come and present ourselves at his feet that we might carry his fragrance that we might adore him Lord make us a house of Bethany we come before you today as we close right now as we close today we pray Lord for a release of the fragrance of your name just come before him today. Would you come, church, today and just come bow before him? And can we just close this time of worship? We're going to pray for Diane Fink. She's going to northern Iraq with the team this week. We're going to pray that she carries the fragrance of Jesus into the Middle East. But would you just come today? Just come. Come on, church. Let's just present ourselves. Let's just present ourselves before the Lord today. Is anyone home? This is how we're closing. If you need to get your kids or go, you're dismissed. But we just want to be a people of his presence. Lord, convict us for distraction. Deliver us from distraction. Remove barriers from us. Lord, let us be a people that pour our love and devotion. Thank you that you're showing us in the example of Mary what it is to be priests that minister to your heart. Release anointing today to be worshipers, to adore you. To, in the middle of everything that's going on in the world be a people of your glory be a people of your name Lord God help us Lord anoint us Lord we bring the oil of intimacy we bring our gifts we bring our treasures we bring our callings and we lay them at your feet we lay them at your feet that you might be glorified today that your presence might permeate every area of our lives through.